we welcome you to this Sunday evening meeting of the Temple Baptist Church. We're certainly thankful to be with God's people on the Lord's Day and worship our great God together. Let's stand. We're going to pray in just a moment. We'd like to welcome our visitors who are with us this evening, and we're very encouraged that you're here. We'll have a special way of greeting you in just a little while. We're grateful to have a number of people who are listening to our live radio broadcast, as well as those who are watching and listening on faithforthefamily.com and thetemplebaptistchurch.com. And we're grateful that the Lord is with us. What a wonderful morning we had, and we were blessed with a great Bible message. And what an encouragement to see so many folks coming and professing their faith publicly, uh, that they've trusted Christ and they're not ashamed. And that was a great blessing, wasn't it? We're looking forward to this service tonight and asking God to meet with us. I'd like to welcome all those who are watching and listening and those with us here present to bow together and pray and ask God to bless our meeting. Our gracious God, we bow in thy presence and thank thee that thou art gracious and merciful, a God of holiness, a God of justice, and yet a God uh, full of pity and a God who cares. So we thank thee that we have a high priest who knows what we go through because he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And we thank thee for our sinless, spotless Savior. We're thankful that he fulfilled all thy law wholly and completely and that he went to the cross and shed his blood and paid our sin debt in full. We thank thee that he arose and that he is at thy right hand even now as we pray, taking our prayers to thee, our great heavenly father. And so we would ask in this service that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up. And as he is lifted up, he would draw lost men and women and boys and girls to himself that he would strengthen and challenge and encourage believers. Work in our hearts tonight. Make us more like our Savior. And may the Holy Spirit do a mighty work in each one of our hearts. As we hear thy word preached, may we be yielded and open to thee. Help us to obey thee tonight. Help us worship thee tonight. Help, help us to give thee praise. For thou art worthy of all of our praise and worship and all of our adoration. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 406. We'll sing a wonderful hymn together, How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord. Hymn 406 is Brother Scoggins comes to lead us. Amen. Let's do our best on this. Hymn number 406. Let's sing it out all together this evening.
so much. You may be seated, and our men are coming with the bulletin. If you need a copy, if you'll raise your hand, please, they'll be happy to bring one to you. And while they're coming, let me pass a few notes along. We're wishing uh, Noni Detmers a happy birthday as she celebrates tomorrow. May God bless her. Also wishing Carolyn Tomlinson a happy birthday on Tuesday. And uh, I know that lady very well. She's the one who brought me into the world. And so wishing her a very happy birthday this week. A special note from our Temple Academy. We had uh, several young people competing in the National Fine Arts Competition in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, congratulations to senior Will Campbell and freshman Canyon Paget as they represented our academy and uh, won first place in debate. And this is our fourth state championship and third national championship over the last few years. And so congratulating Will and Canyon and also uh, Mrs. Jessica Sexton, who is the debate team coach. And so we're happy for them. If you look at the bulletin with me, we are thankful uh, for these upcoming commencements and graduations. And so I encourage students around you and some are finishing up their work and we want to be a blessing to them. We're praying, as you look on the inside, we're praying for our deacons continually, and we're praying for the Zinker as he brings a message tonight. And then on Wednesday night, I hope you'll be back with us at seven o'clock. And I'm happy to have a church planner who trained here in our church and now is striking out to plant a church in Montana very soon. And they'll be with us, Daniel and Lindsey Grover. And Brother Daniel will bring a special report and a Bible message. And let's encourage him and his family all we can on Wednesday night. Continue to pray for these other needs that are listed here and uh, praying on the back for our camp season coming up and excited about that as well. Please pray about doing your part in helping Mount Moriah with these special needs that are upcoming. Let me give you these prayer requests if you allow me and I hope you'll keep these names with you throughout the week. And these are those who are going through some special needs and we wanna pray for God's help and his touch in their life throughout the week. We'll ask Brother Stephen to come lead us in prayer in just a moment. Pray for Gail Washington, please, in the home going of her sister, Mary. And of course, we've been praying for Mary for many months, and now she's with the Lord Jesus, and uh, we know that she's well, but we're praying for her family and other friends who are going to miss her much. Pray for Jane Devereaux, who has been admitted to the hospital. Please pray for Margie Edwards, who's also going through health needs at this time, and Carol Miller, Jewel Pound's sister, has had a fall and we want to pray for her recovery. Uh, please continue to lift up Teresa Gregory as she goes through uh, different treatments and uh, really tests undergoing at this time for a diagnosed cancer. And we want to pray that God will touch her and help her. And continue to pray for Mrs. Sexton as she goes through cancer treatment and also Amelia Barrett and Naomi Kiefer. And then a special word that we need to pray very fervently for Catherine Sampson. Of course, this is Mrs. Sexton's sister-in-law and uh, Pastor Sexton's sister, and she's in the intensive care unit today and has been battling cancer for quite some time. I want to pray in a special way for her tonight in the meeting. And then continue to lift up Bennett Deku and his treatments that he's undergoing right now. So let's join our hearts together as Brother Stephen leads us. And let's take these knees to the Lord and believe that God can hear and answer these prayers. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this opportunity we have to be in thy house this evening. Uh, Lord, we do thank you for the strength you've given us. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us in this, uh, in this meeting to bring you honor and glory with our lives. And I pray, Lord, you would continue to bless every part of this and be with Brother Zinker tonight in a special way. I pray that you would work among us and give us exactly what we need tonight. Uh, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing here at the Temple Baptist Church, and I pray that you would continue this work. And Lord, I pray you would continue to give us direction for the future. And uh, Lord, we uh, pray for so many who are dealing with difficulty tonight. And Lord, we do pray that you would encourage them and help them. Uh, Lord, we do pray for uh, Miss Gail Washington and her family and the loss of Miss Mary Vincent. Lord, we pray that you'd please be with them in a special way. Uh, Lord, I pray for uh, so many in this church who uh, have known her and have been close to her, Lord. I pray you just please comfort and uh, help us, Lord. I pray you be with uh, the Washingtons especially. Uh, Lord, I do pray for Jane Devereaux now that you'd please uh, touch her, Lord, and help her raise her up. And we pray that you would just please be with her in this time. We pray for Margie uh, Edwards as well, Lord, that you'd please help her, uh, Lord, in, in these health difficulties she's having, and for Carol Miller as well. 
Uh, Lord, you please raise her up. We pray for Teresa Gregory now. Uh, Lord, you please be with her in this in this time and this difficulty she's dealing with. We pray that you would uh, please guide the doctors. And Lord, that you would please work in her life and bring her through this safely. We pray that you would, uh, Lord, just work on her behalf even this week. We continue to pray for Miss Sexton. Uh, Lord, you would continue to give her strength. Uh, day by day, and Lord, you would continue to help her. We pray for Amelia Barrett, and uh, Lord, for Bennett Deku. Lord, we pray that you'd be with these, and for Naomi Kiefer as well. And Lord, we pray especially tonight for Catherine Sampson. Uh, Lord, you please be with her in this time, and Lord, I pray that you would raise her up, and uh, Lord, that you would just continue to help her and, uh, and bring her uh, out of the hospital and raise her up. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing, and Lord, we're so thankful for uh, Lord, just the blessings you've given us and uh, how you've even worked this day and the souls that have come to know you. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to continue to press forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's listen carefully. Brother Fox is coming to sing along with our choir, and we know we'll be blessed. The song is entitled, We Preach Christ.
thank the Lord for that. Let's take our hymn book, please, and turn to hymn number 337. Hymn number 337, we'll sing that together in just a moment. And as always, it's a delight to have guests with us. And some of you are friends that we've known from the past, and we're happy you're back with us. And some of you are new, and we're happy that you're here. We're praying that you'll receive a great blessing by being with us. It's been good to have Brother Joel Deku with us from out in Montana, and he'll be giving just a brief update at the conclusion of the meeting tonight, and we're happy he can be here. He's headed back in just a few days, so we want you to pray for him in a special way. If you're our guest, we'll ask you to please remain seated. That's a seat of honor. Our men will find you in just a moment and pass along a few things that we hope will encourage you. If you call the Temple Baptist Church your church home, let's stand together, please, and let's sing, There Will Never Be a Sweeter Story. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? In 337, let's sing this out all together. a very special day here today uh, in our bus ministry and today uh, we have uh, celebrated bus captain appreciation day and uh, we appreciate so much uh, the faithfulness of those who go out into this community week after week and reach the lost and bring uh, boys and girls teenagers and families uh, to the temple baptist church every week and we'd like to ask our bus captains to go ahead and make their way up here this evening and we'd like to um, have them come and uh, share with us. We want you to get to know them and share what community that they're serving in. And they're going to come right over here on this side. And uh, we're going to ask Brother Nathan to come and share a word with us. 
and then we'll ask them to come and uh, tell us about which route and community they serve in. Well, amen. I'm thankful for a great day that we had today. 268 riders rode our buses this morning, 37 of which were brand new riders. Many of those came in here this morning and made a profession of faith. I just have one verse I'd like to share, and it's in um, Romans 10, 15. It says, as, is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I'm very thankful to have the opportunity and privilege to work alongside of so many faithful bus captains and community leaders, many of which have been there years and years. And I'm glad the Lord has given me the chance to help them and they help this church in so many different ways. I'm thankful for people like them because it's a person like them that reached my mother when she was nine years old and she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ through the bus ministry. So I love the bus ministry. If you're looking for a place to plug in, these are the people to get a hold of. And if they come hunting for you and looking for some help, I encourage you to help them out. They, there's a, a lot to be done and we're thankful for the bus ministry. Um, so if you all wanna come forward now and just share something about your route. Well, my name is Isaac Sheets and I'm the bus captain of the North Knoxville bus route with my wife, Abigail. Uh, tried to get her to come up here with me, but she wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, pray for her. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm so grateful that God's given me the opportunity and, and her the opportunity to be the bus captain for almost a year now. Uh, but before that, we helped with Dan and Amy Baker as the bus captain for uh, um, maybe about six or seven years was how long I w I've been involved with it. But uh, God's blessed me tremendously and changed my life through my involvement in the bus ministry. I'm so grateful for it. I'm Ed Hibbert, and I'm the bus captain for the Carnes Community Bus Route, which extends into Hardin Valley as well as Cedar Bluff, too. And I've been the bus captain there for about 16 years now and uh, seen lots of young people come to know the Lord and uh, very thankful for all of our great workers that we have on our bus route and looking forward to reaching more folks with the, the gospel of Christ. Uh, if there, anyone is in the Carnes community and would like to help out this summer on our bus route, uh, please see me. I'd like to get your help. God bless you. My name is Zach McKinney, and I'm the captain of the Halls bus route, and uh, this is about my second year being the captain. I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to work with young people. My name is Lance Tomlinson, captain of the Norwood bus route. I've been serving on the route for about three years now, and I'm blessed to have been the captain for about three months now. Thank you. My name is Nathan Karn, and I have been the captain of the Westview bus route for about a year now. The Lord has allowed me opportunities, though, uh, throughout my 40 years of life to serve him at each ministry that I've been involved in. And I appreciate the Temple Baptist Church's heart that pastor instilled within it in of the bus ministry. So if you ever want to get involved in the bus ministry, I would definitely encourage you to do so. And uh, you could really uh, brighten and more importantly, change a child's life. My name is Sabrina McElyay and I'm involved with the deaf. We don't have a bus, we don't have a van, we have cars, because most of our people drive themselves in. But I do have to say that our group, we're the best. And if you want to be involved with the best, you don't have to have skill, you just have to have a willing heart. And yes, like I said, we have the best group. <laughs> My name is Jonathan Moeller and I've been serving in the East Knoxville community for about 10 years and I'm grateful for what I've been able to see God do and the hearts God's touched and the people I've been able to work with. Good evening, my name is Austin Burt and I've had the privilege, my wife and I have had the privilege of um, working in the bus ministry for the last five years and God has given us the opportunity of becoming the bus captains of the Oak Ridge uh, bus route for the last six months. We praise God for it, what he is doing in the bus ministry and what he will continue to do. Thank you. My name is Eric Jones and I am the bus captain of the Broadway bus route and I'm going on three years. Good evening. My name is Marcus Moran and I am the bus captain of the Bearden bus route and I was helping, I think, 
a year before I became the bus captain, but I've been the bus captain for about a year now, helped my brother-in-law and sister when they were the bus captains. But really, I just want to say, you know, thank you to the Temple Baptist Church for just giving us the opportunity to serve in the bus ministry and thankful for my workers as well because they are the best. So thank you all. My name is Mike Dixon. I'm on the Inskip and Fountain City bus route. I served with Gary Rush for many years and now I'm the bus captain. And I can say the Lord has really blessed me and one soul is worth it all. Hey, good evening. My name's Andy Paget. I serve as the bus captain for the Powell community. And we're actually combined now, Powell and Claxton. And uh, I've been the bus captain for about 16 years now. And pastor preached a message, a series of messages through the book of Jude. And Jude 22 talks about making a difference. And that's, that's what we're striving to do in the Powell community, is just make a difference in, in the children's lives. Thank you. I'm Andrew Yates, I'm on the Lonsdale Western Heights route and I've been there for around 16 years and been blessed with amazing workers and it's more of a blessing you get from it than you give. So anybody who wants to join up, we'd love to have you. Wasn't that a blessing? Well, let's stand together. Ushers are going to come forward to receive our offering this evening. I'd like to ask Brother Dan Weber, if he would, to come and lead us in prayer for the offering in just a moment. For the offertory, Nathaniel Collins, and Jonathan Hibbard are playing hymn number 197. It is no secret what God can do. What a blessing to see what God is doing here in our local community as the gospel goes out and children and teens and families are reached through our bus ministry. And as we give, the tithe belongs to the Lord and we give above and beyond the tithe and our offerings. That's what enables us to go out, buy fuel for the buses, pay for the insurance on the buses, help uh, these children come and hear the gospel. And like we saw this morning, what a blessing to see so many young people trusting Christ as their savior. And so we have this opportunity to be engaged in the work of God. Let's give faithfully and we trust that God will meet the need. Let's pray together as Brother Weber leads us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for providing for us. I pray now that you would help us uh, tonight to glorify you and the things that are said and done. I pray that you would meet with us and guide and direct in our lives. Help us to continue to be faithful to you. Use this offering for the furtherance of your work and the gospel ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. amen.
Thank you, Nathaniel and Jonathan. We have Young Men's Quartet coming to sing, and then we're happy to have Brother Zinker bringing the message from God's Word, and I trust our hearts are ready to receive what the Lord has for us from His Word tonight. Pray for Brother Zinker as he preaches in a moment, and pray for this quartet as they sing, Here Am I. and dying in this world today have you heard their crying or do you turn away the harvest now is plenteous but the laborers are few God needs some willing vessels to be and flow Is it too late for caring Does Jesus really say Are we truly praying for the blind to find their way Little children are falling into take your Bible and turn with me in the New Testament to the book of Hebrews chapter 2 and we'll take our passage of scripture from this text this evening Hebrews chapter 2 and it's a privilege to have the opportunity to speak this evening I'm very thankful for it and it's a blessing to be a part of the Temple Baptist Church what a wonderful church family we have it's wonderful to be a part of a praying church and a giving church and a church where we love one another and that's a great great encouragement and blessing Hebrews chapter 2, we'll be reading in verse 1, and we'll read to the end of verse 4. I hope you found your place there. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward... How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. I'd like to draw your attention to a phrase we find in chapter 2 of Hebrews and verse 3. The Bible says this, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? This is a gospel church. This is a church 
that you can welcome lost friends and loved ones to attend and as you know that you'll bring them that they'll hear the gospel preached and that's a wonderful blessing to be a part of a gospel preaching church and so the Lord has placed this text on my heart this evening to bring the gospel there are people here tonight who are uncertain about their salvation they may have real doubts perhaps they've never shared with others but they have lingering doubts in their soul whether they're truly saved There may be people here who have in the past made a false profession of faith. Oh, you've you've said you've been saved, but if you were to really look at your life, there's really been no work of grace. There's been no change by the power of the gospel. It seems you hate the things God loves and love the things God hates. And it seems as though there's no real genuine evidence of salvation coming to your heart. And so tonight... I just wanted to bring a simple gospel message to challenge all of us. You say, well, I'm saved. Well, if you're saved, you should certainly rejoice in the gospel. And we're so grateful that the gospel is not just to be preached to those who are lost. It's to be preached to ourselves each day. It reminds us that we are not saved by our merit. We are saved by God's grace. And we can rejoice in the grace of God. So whether you're lost or saved this evening, this message is for all of us. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? 112 years ago tonight at 11.40 p.m., the Titanic hit an iceberg. Just about four hours later, just after 2 a.m. on April the 15th, the Titanic sunk beneath the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. And we're all familiar with that tragedy though it happened before any of us ever were born when I say the word Titanic you instantly think of a sinking ship and it is known as the greatest peacetime maritime disaster in world history more people were killed on the Titanic at that time than anyone else ever has been in any peaceful shipping disaster and it is such a tragedy it is such a disaster because It was entirely avoidable. The the Titanic has served as sermon illustrations, no doubt, since it happened. Pastor Sexton has an amazing message. You can find it on the internet. One thing thou lackest, a message about the sinking of the Titanic. And it served preachers through the decades of the last 112 years to help us understand that this tragedy of the Titanic shrinks in comparison to the tragedy of a soul who lives in this world and dies without Christ and spends eternity in hell because that is a great tragedy because it was entirely avoidable. So as we think about some things this evening, I'd like this phrase to return to your mind. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? To neglect is to fail to care for properly. So many people care for their bodies. They care for their children and their families. They care for everything else, but they fail to care properly for their own salvation. They never give consideration to whether or not they're saved or lost, headed to heaven or hell. And so tonight, may I just encourage you as we think about this question God poses to us, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The Titanic is really a parable of sorts, isn't it? Of a world that is opulent and extravagant and welcoming and wonderful, but it is doomed. This world that seems so welcoming with its wide gate and broad way that many there be that go in there at. The Bible tells us that there are so many people who are attracted to all that the world seems to have to offer, but little do they know when they board. The world is set for doom and destruction. And there is only one way to be rescued. And that only one way, we are told, is through the Lord Jesus Christ and believing on the gospel. You say, what is the gospel? It is the good news that Jesus Christ, the perfect spotless Son of God, came to this earth and took on flesh without ceasing to be God. He lived a perfect life. He never once sinned. And so he is the only person who has ever walked this earth who never deserved to die because the wages of sin is death. 
But because he never sinned, he never deserved to die. But yet he did die. He was nailed to a cross. He shed his blood and he died not for his own sin. He had none. He died for my sin and he died for your sin. He paid our sin debt in full. And when he shed his blood and he died, he cried, it is finished. He paid the full price for our sin. The Bible tells us he was buried in the tomb for three days. And after three days, he rose again and he is alive forevermore. And you say, how do you really know he's alive? Because I've met him and he's changed my life. And everyone who's ever met him could say this, he lives. Jesus Christ is alive and he's still saving people. And he's able to save anyone who would come to him by faith for salvation. The old preacher said he saved from the uttermost to the guttermost. And he certainly does. He's a living savior. That is the good news of the gospel. And so tonight, there are people here perhaps who have never divulged their doubts about their salvation. They've never spoken, perhaps even to anyone else, their closest relatives about the uncertainty they face at night when they wake up and think, where will I be in eternity? And so I'd like you to think this evening, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Could I just share a few things about the Titanic the design of the Titanic took three years to build. It was extravagant. It was opulent. It was the largest ship in the world. 882 and a half feet long, 11 stories high. It was called a, a ship that needed no lifeboats because it was a lifeboat itself. The bottom of the hull was one solid piece of five foot thick steel. Harlan and Wolf shipyards in Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, more than one witness had said that someone had taken a piece of chalk and when it was in dry dock, written on the side of the hull of the Titanic, even God couldn't sink this ship. It was designed with a number of watertight compartments and it was said that it was unsinkable. It was designed to be the safest ship around, the safest ship that had ever set to sea. Psalm 127 verse 1 says this, unless the Lord build the house... They labor in vain that built it. Without God, all of our best designs for life fail utterly and miserably. The Titanic with the best designers, no ship was ever safer. No ship ever gave more confidence. No ship ever provided as much security. And they had planned for all contingencies. They said there's fail-safes and there are things that will happen to back up the fail-safes if anything were to happen. And so much confidence was placed in this unsinkable ship that instead of having the planned 64 lifeboats that were supposed to be, that were designed to be on the boat, instead of having 64 lifeboats, they only put 20 because they said there's no need even for 20. We'll just have them there on, on, the, on the boat for aesthetics. We'll never certainly need them. This ship is unsinkable. And this world thinks today that it's unsinkable. It looks at Christianity and it says, what a chore and what a bore to have to go to church and pray and read the Bible and live the Christian life. What a horrible drudgery of a life. We have the freedom to do what we'd like. We can live in whatever way we please and we're free to do so. And they believe that they're entirely safe and entirely unsinkable. They plan for every contingency and there's no way they can fail. Could I tell you about the delights of the Titanic? This was the first ship ever to have a heated indoor swimming pool. We don't think much about that, but this is back in 1912, early 1900s. It not only had that, it had a Parisian cafe and they imported Parisian chefs and waiters to work at the Parisian cafe. They had a six foot deep salt water water spa, a pool that was heated. And that was an amazing thing in those days. Five amazingly extravagant grand pianos, a restaurant with large palm trees, several casinos for that day, something amazing, a photography studio, tennis courts. They had on board 12,000 bottles of wine, 10,000 cigars, 8,000 decks of cards. It was said to be the most opulent object on planet earth it was something that the wealthiest of people desired to be a part of proverbs chapter 18 verse 12 says this there is a way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof 
are the ways of death. Everyone who boarded the Titanic when they came on, perhaps at Southampton or other places where it stopped, thought this is going to be the greatest voyage of my life. This is going to be something amazing that I'm going to enjoy. Little did anyone expect that this ship was going down. Today we use the word Titanic as a byword, something that's doomed to fail. But may I say, there were so many delights that welcomed the passengers and I would suppose that none of them when they walked on board the ship would ever think, this is the last time I'll ever board a ship. Because the great majority of them perished. Of the 2,000 who went on board, 2,240, 1,517 died. Only 706 of the 2,240 survived. What a tragedy. And it was great tragedy because it was entirely avoidable. I want you to notice something about the distinctions that you and I make. We, we seem to think that those who have it all together must be doing fairly well. But here on the Titanic, there were several distinctions made. There were different classes. First class dignitaries, there were 17 millionaires on board in fact and they bought uh, certain cabins uh, that would be very expensive the stateroom ticket was in today's money it would have cost $64,000 to have a stateroom these were wealthy people these were millionaires 17 millionaires on board every evening they had an 11 course meal John Jacob Astor, one of the hotel magnates of Europe and North America, Isambard Strauss, someone who's connected eventually with the Levi Strauss company, they're in first class. Second class is still very expensive. The best of music, the best of talent, the best of shows are made available to second class customers. And then steerage, the low fare, third class. The low fare would be, in today's money, about $1,068. Cramped quarters, very close bunks, one on top of another. But they were so happy to be on the world's most luxurious ship, the world's safest liner. The day the Titanic sank outside the Liverpool offices of the White Star Line, the company that owned and built the Titanic, there were not three classes, however. There wasn't first class and second class and third class. There were only two signs outside that office in Liverpool that day. And the two signs said this. One said, known to be lost. And there was a list of names. And the other sign said this, known to be saved. And there was a list of names. And you and I may think of different people in different classes in this world. Some are rich, some are wealthy, some are poor, some are middle class. I don't know where you are this evening, but when we see the great judge of all the earth, what our class on earth was will not matter. There are only two distinctions, known to be saved or known to be lost. Which one are you? Do you know with certainty that you're saved? Or are there doubts and nagging things in your heart to say, I, I don't know if I were to meet God tonight, I've, I've pushed it aside, I've put it to the back of my mind so many times, I'm even confused now myself and I'm not sure or certain that I'm saved. You'll either known to be lost or known to be saved. Psalm 49 verse 2 says this, both low and high, rich and poor together. All the money in the world could not save them on the Titanic. The disaster of the Titanic happened, as I mentioned, at 11.40 p.m. on April the 14th. It struck an iceberg. And several things happened over the next few hours before at around 2.05 a.m. it sank beneath the Atlantic surface. The ship's crew had ignored repeated warnings. This is something very interesting. The ship's telegram operator uh, had received not one or two or four or five, but seven different telegrams that they were going through an iceberg field and that they should slow down. Other ships that had already seen these icebergs had wired to the Titanic and let them know seven different times not to follow that path and to slow down because there were a number of icebergs and it was very dangerous. But the telegram operator was so busy passing out telegrams 
to personal people. Many of the millionaires on board wanted to get back and forth with their businesses in the United States and in England that he never took the time to read the messages of warning. Does that sound familiar to so many people? They're so busy with life, they never take the time to read the message of warning that God graciously sends us. The end is coming. We will someday meet God. Are we ready? Are we prepared to meet God? And just like that telegram operator ignored so many other things, the ship's passengers, when the iceberg was struck, many of the passengers rejected the warnings of the porters. It's recorded in the congressional hearing that was taking place just after the Titanic sank here in the United States. There was a congressional hearing about it and several people said this, there were six different gamblers who were gambling in the salon and when the ship struck the iceberg, they all walked out to the deck, they looked around and they said, there's really nothing to see here. They went back in and continued gambling. The porters encouraged them to get back on the boats. The most famous tennis player of his day, a man named Norris Williams was on board with his father and they went out on the deck to see what had happened. And when they saw it, Norris Williams and his father said this, we are going not to get on the lifeboats, but rather we're going back to the gymnasium and we're going to ride some exercise bikes because we don't think anything of us. We're not getting in the boats. We won't get in the lifeboats. And I know some people who hear the gospel and hear the warnings and yet never heed the warnings. Have you met people who know the warnings but do not heed the warnings and it's such a tragedy because it's an avoidable tragedy. Many of the first class passengers refused commands to get into the lifeboats. Three different millionaires went onto the deck and refused to get into the lifeboats and instead returned to their bed and died there just a short time later. One of the millionaires said this, why should I get in a lifeboat when it'll just return within the hour? And they would not take heed. They would not listen. There were Many of the lifeboats that were there were put down and at first very few people would get into the lifeboats. They held 65 people, but the first lifeboat that was sent out only had 10 people in it. People refused to believe this ship can't go down. It's the unsinkable Titanic. It has watertight compartments. I don't see the difficulty. I don't see any doom. And don't we live in a world with people very much like that? Things seem to be going well for me. I don't see the end is near. I don't see any destruction about. I think I'm just going to carry on continuing what I'm doing. And the first lifeboat went out with only 10 people. The second lifeboat went out, had only 12 people, 65 seats, but only 12 people. The third lifeboat went out and had 15 people in it. And so many lives were lost because they would not heed the instruction of the porters to get in the lifeboats. Could I say to you, Today, my friend, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, God has sent porters to you to say, get in the lifeboat. This ship is going down. This world is going to face doom and disaster and all those on it will go down with it. And there are people that God sends into your life and says, take the lifeboat while there is time. The self-sufficient People on the boat that day on that great ship disdained the instructions until it was too late. The famous wealthy gentleman named John Jacob Astor was told to put on his life belt. There were life belts for many who were on board that day and so the porters began handing out life belts. All the boats had been sent away and now they were to wear the life belt. John Jacob Astor refused, he refused three different times we're told and finally when all the life belts had been given out to others, he asked for one. And the porter said, we're all out, Mr. Astor. I'm so sorry. He said this, and I quote, he said, I did not think I would ever need it. And isn't that the way it goes with so many in salvation? By the time it is too late, they say this, I just never thought I would need it. Oh, I've met people who've said this, I'm going to have a deathbed conversion. I'm going to sow my wild oats and enjoy my youth and do my thing and not have to live a boring Christian life and do things Christians have to do, like go to church all the time and not have fun and not have parties on the weekends. And I, I, I want to live. And after I've lived my whole life and enjoyed all of that, then and only then am I going to yield to God. And on my deathbed, when I've got nothing left to give, you know, I'm going to pray that prayer and 
you know, he'll have to hear me. Can I say this to you, my friend? Don't depend on a deathbed conversion because many never make it to a deathbed. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then could I just close by saying this? There was deliverance from the Titanic. There were those lifeboats that at first people didn't think they needed to get in. And then as the ship began to sink, people began to jump on the lifeboats and far more people than the lifeboats could hold. And the last lifeboats that went out were seen trying to cling to them. Could I just make a practical application as we close? Many of the lifeboats that safely got away from the Titanic rode out so they wouldn't be dragged down by the vacuum when the big ship sank. And here's the interesting thing, that after the ship went down and there were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people flailing in ice cold waters, very few, if any, of the lifeboats came back to rescue them. The congressional hearing asked the reason, why did the lifeboats not return, return sooner to rescue those in the water? And two reasons were given, fear of danger and a lack of empathy. And there are Christians who are in the lifeboats and they hear the cries of the lost, but they say, let's not go now. What if someone says something? What if I'm embarrassed? What if something bad were to happen? I'm afraid to go rescue the perishing and care for the dying. Or maybe some other Christian says this, I'm just too busy. We all have difficulties. Everyone has something to deal with and you lack empathy. Are you selfish? Are you afraid? There's no excuse. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Why is it the greatest maritime disaster ever? Because it was entirely avoidable. They had made contingencies for everything. They had thought of everything. There was nothing that could happen that they hadn't thought of. But Fred Fleet, one of the watchmen who at the congressional hearing said something very interesting. They could not find one thing. 10,000 bottles of wine, 8,000 cigars, thousands of opulent things, all the things the world could have to offer. But Fred Fleet said this, they missed one thing. You know what it was? A pair of binoculars. And that giant ship, the largest in the world, sank after it struck an iceberg because, Fred Fleet said, no one was there to look through the binoculars. They couldn't find the binoculars. You may have all your bases covered. You may have everyone fooled. You may even have fooled yourself, but there will come a day when there's something that will happen that you will not have the answer to. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior, you will face great disaster. I'm saying to you tonight, perhaps you're here and you're uncertain about your salvation. Perhaps you've never even made a profession of faith in Christ. And you know tonight, God has spoken to your heart. You've neglected this great salvation. You've cared for so many other things, but you've neglected your own soul. Tonight, would you come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? And for the believer here who's safely in the lifeboat, would you, in spite of your fear and in spite of your apathy, would you go close enough to rescue those who are perishing? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us tonight. We think about this great tragic disaster and it was tragic because it could have been avoided. And we think of an even greater disaster, the loss of an eternal soul. And we pray that tonight, those who do not yet know Christ as their savior would come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Do a great work of conviction in their own heart before it's too late. For believers who have lost loved ones, friends who do not yet know Christ, we pray that they would overcome their fear, their embarrassment, their apathy, and we pray that they would go out to rescue the perishing, help us all be better at seeing eternal souls, people for whom Christ died. Help us have a growing burden and a desire to reach them with the truth. Work in a mighty way, we ask. 
before I close my prayer, may I ask this question? You're here tonight and you would say, I know that I've neglected my soul. Perhaps you're confused about your salvation. Perhaps you're not certain. You'd, you have no assurance, but you would like to. And you'd say, I sincerely want to know with certainty that I'm saved. But I'm not certain about that tonight. I'd like to be. Would you lift your hand tonight? You'd say, that's me. I'm struggling. I have questions. I have doubts. Thank you. Who else would say that tonight? Who else would say, that's me. I have struggles in my heart. I'm not sure about where I stand before the Lord. Who else would say this evening, that's me. I know I don't have assurance, but I'd like to have assurance. Who would say this evening, I have a loved one, a friend, a coworker, and I've been afraid to be a witness. I've been hesitant. I've been fearful. If God knows my heart, I've really even been apathetic. I really haven't cared as I ought to have cared but I want to ask God to help me tonight to man those lifeboats and to go out and whatever it costs to me to rescue the perishing. And God has spoken to my heart. Would you lift your hand this evening and say, that's me. So many of us need encouragement in that. Heavenly Father, help us obey thee. May we trust thee. May we get out with the gospel. Guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me? We're going to sing together. Hymn number 417, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. If God has dealt with you about salvation, would you come tonight? Our workers are here with the word of God. They'll be happy to speak to you about how you can know with certainty Christ is your savior. If God has spoken to you about being a better witness, a more bold and outgoing witness, would you come this evening and ask him for help? Let's sing hymn number 417. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. God, we thank thee for speaking to our hearts this evening. We're thankful for yet another opportunity of thy mercy. We're thankful for the gospel and the power of the gospel and how it works in people's hearts. Help those who've come tonight. May we be more, more soul conscious. May we trust thee to help us be better witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Guide us and help us. Work in the souls of those who struggle with their assurance, who have questions and doubts. Meet with them. Show them where they stand before thee. Guide them, we ask. Help all of us to trust thee with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you'd like to return to your seat, you're welcome to do that in the congregation. You may be seated. I'd like to ask Brother Joel Deku, if he would, to come to the pulpit in a moment. 
and he's going to be leaving us here in just the next few days, but he's been able to be here, and we've been praying, of course, for Bennett and trusting the Lord to continue to work in Bennett's life, and we're very grateful that the Dekus are directing the work at the Passage Northwest, and he'd like to give a brief uh, testimony about how the Lord is at work, and so we're very grateful they're here. I hope you'll continue to pray for the Passage Northwest. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's just been such a joy to be back here for a couple weeks, and thank you so much. I want to start by just saying thank you, and it doesn't seem adequate enough to express just our appreciation for your love for us and our family, and uh, truly, we are grateful for you, all of you. Thank you for your care of my wife and our kids, and just especially for the prayers for our son, Bennett, <laughs> and um I can't express it. It's just overwhelming. I'll tell you what, I don't know how people make it without being a part of God's family, but I'm sure glad I don't have to. And uh, we just appreciate so much this church and uh, what it means to us personally and spiritually, how God has worked here in our lives and continues to do so. I wanna bring a good word from another part of America that this church is going forth with the gospel. The message tonight, what a powerful message, because that's all that really matters, isn't it? Is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for Pastor Sexton and for the emphasis, the biblical emphasis of the gospel that all the earth will know. And that's the desire that God's given all of us and we ought to have. And may we not allow fear or apathy to keep us from going forth but may we go forth by faith and allow God to do that. And God is doing a work in the Northwest. And we want to appreciate, we want to say thank you for your prayers and your support of what God is doing there. Uh, it would not be possible without you. And so thank you for that. Uh, the work of the passage is just uh, continues to grow. We're seeing more and more uh, things that God is doing. Uh, Jesus Christ said that the laborers are few. And the Northwest is a needy area. I don't like to say that it's unevangelized, it's just under-evangelized. And it needs more laborers as do most places. And God is beginning to do this and we're grateful for that. Um, I'm so thrilled that Brother Grover's be able to come and to speak on Wednesday and I don't wanna steal any of his thunder, but it's exciting what God is doing and uh, the thrust of church planting is the heart of the passage. And uh, that was the heart of Pastor Sexton and his vision for the passage, that it would be a beachhead for us to go forth with the gospel and strengthen that which remains and to see new works established for the glory of God. And we need to be busy about it, don't we? Because the Lord is coming soon. And so we ask that you continue to pray. Uh, we've had a great semester so far this year. Uh, we've been able to get into Canada for the first time. And so thrilled about that. It's just so amazing where uh, the passage is located. We're so centrally located to reach all these regions around us. And we're asking that the Lord will just do what only he can do and to get the gospel to these places. Will you continue to pray for us in the work of the passage? Because it's all about the gospel. It's about getting people. Uh, it's being the porters, as we've heard tonight, to take the gospel so that people can hear before it's too late. There are some that have been there for a semester now that have come back to the Northwest and we're thrilled about this and they're serving and God is doing a great work, but there's much more to be done, isn't there? And I pray that the Lord will continue to do it. Thank you for praying for our family through this. And I'm so grateful for my wife. She's coming back tomorrow. She's been gone for a week. And that's why one of the reasons I'm here and uh, it's a teamwork. And uh, she had a ladies, a pastor's wives retreat this week. And so grateful for all the many pastor's wives that came and uh, were encouraged as they go back and minister beside their husbands. And uh, it, the Northwest is a unique place. Uh, one of the things that is really difficult for me, I'll be honest with you, because we used to live on the equator where the sun shone 12 hours every day. During the winter, 
it gets light maybe around nine o'clock in the morning and it gets dark by four o'clock in the afternoon. And I tell you what, it's difficult because we get out there trying to get things done. And the verse that comes to mind is what the Lord Jesus Christ said. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And there's days in the winter when we're trying to get everything done because his darkness is upon us. And I'll tell you what, the darkness is, is ever growing, isn't it? And we're living in these last times, but it shouldn't cause us to fear. It should cause us to work even harder. And we're asking the Lord to do even greater things in the days ahead. We're gearing up for a great summer. Will you pray for us? Every summer we've seen consistent growth and more and more churches and young people coming, young people getting saved, surrendering their lives. Some have even come now here to Crown College and we're so grateful for that. We're asking God to do even greater things in the days ahead. I'd like to just show a very short video, one that was made several years ago and it's, it's our pastor and it's him speaking about this place. And in it, you'll hear what he mentions about his heart and his vision for it. And I hope that as you hear this, that we'll all be reminded of it and that we'll pray and ask God to continue to do the work that he's promised to do. But I wanna say thank you again so much and we'll see you again, whether here, there, or in the air, amen? God bless you all, we love you, thank you. But one of the most amazing doors I've ever seen open is what God has opened for us in the Northwest in Heron, Montana for a piece of property and buildings that are truly amazing. And it's, it's ours. It's, it's for all of us. It's for us to use for church planning, youth camps, uh, to train laborers as a training center for young people who will be helping in churches throughout the Northwest. It's been a school in Heron, Montana. The Monarch School has been closed for a couple of years, and now it's opening up for us. It's a property we can own and use. It can be your property in this Northwest area to, for a passage through to the Northwest, to Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, parts of Canada, for the church planning thrust that we all need to see happening there and want to be a part of. I'm telling you something, you want to be involved in this. If we could pick the neediest place in America for soul winning, local churches to be on fire for God, church planting, the neediest place in America, I think we could all honestly agree that the Northwest is the place we need to concentrate. And it is an amazing thing that God has opened this door. And I want you to plan to be there in Heron, Montana, with us. It's for all of us in this special place where God has opened the door. What an amazing thing to see the vision that God put in our pastor's heart, and now that vision is being realized. What a blessing. And we're so grateful for that, thankful for the Dekus and the Grovers and others who are uh, seeing that vision fulfilled, and we're praying for them. Let's stand together. We're going to close our meeting in prayer and trust that the Lord will help us. I'd like to ask Brother Colbert, if he would, to come and close our meeting in just a moment as he prays. I'd like to mention the Life of David, Volume 2, as well as the Family Devotional Guide, Volume 4, for the month of April here are both available at the door marked Europe. So on your way out, I hope you'll pick up a copy of each of those and avail yourself of them. They'll be a great help to you, and we're grateful for that. God has been good to us today. We're so grateful for each one who's come this morning and this evening as well. Let's pray for one another, encourage one another, and trust that the Lord will do a great work this week as we get out the gospel that people will be saved. God bless you. I hope you'll be right in your place on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock. Be right here. We're trusting God to do a great thing in our midweek service. Let's pray together. Our great God, we are so wonderfully grateful for how you've met with us in this place tonight, and we thank you for the power of the gospel. 
And we know that by it, lives can be changed and, and uh, so many wonderful things can be accomplished. So help us, Lord, now be faithful to go and carry the gospel everywhere we go. And we ask that you would dismiss us with your blessing, bring us back together, watch over us all. And I pray that you continue to use our church for thy glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.